Beyond the farthest galaxies viewed by the greatest telescopes on Earth, beyond the limits of our universe, lies another place. A place of magic, myth, sorcery and science. Through the cosmic clouds spins a solar system with a Type III star twinkling in the ether of interstellar space. About the star rotate worlds inconceivable to mere mortal minds. They are populated by demons and demigods, sorcerers and sibyls, men and women imbued with the powers of good and evil. One of these planets orbiting the star shines blue-green with a mantle of clear air and fleecy clouds, surrounding a globe of everlasting beauty and great diversity. This world, Eternia, represents a microcosm of all the universe's inhabited planets. Two great land masses balance the globe. The western hemisphere roughly approximates an hourglass. The southern part of the continent blooms year-round, supplying all Eternia's citizens with sustenance. The great palace of Eternia rises from the fertile southern plain, and has been the home of the reigning monarchs for untold generations. Gently sloping up there rises the evergreen forest, a vast, mostly unexplored, country of towering trees, giant ferns and lush undergrowth, teeming with game animals, as well as some unwholesome creatures. Winged dragons called wyverns perch amongst the trees, and dracos, fierce dragon-like beasts, slither through the underbrush in order to catch unwary travellers. The evergreen forest shields the most mysterious secret on all Eternia, a secret which eventually must be divulged if the planet will survive. The vine jungle rises steamily on the equatorial belt. Within its green and humid confines, swamps bubble, and strange malformed animals and plant life, some of which are one and the same, lurk. Eternians rarely step foot in the vine jungle, and when they do, there's always the possibility they'll never be seen again. The jungle slowly gives way to a stark, low veldt as it moves steadily towards temperate and colder climes. The ice mountains tower over the northern part of the western continent, immense and foreboding peaks shrouded throughout most of the year by snow-laden clouds glower over the landscape. Within their fastness dwell dwarves, trolls and gnolls. The dwarves, a sturdy and industrious race, live far longer than ordinary humans. Generally friendly and outgoing, they enjoy carousing and decorate their clothes with bright pieces of cloth and metal. On the other hand, carnivorous trolls attack anything in their path with clawed hands and feet, but fear the dwarves' weapons and magic. The intelligent but evil gnolls live in the old, used-up dwarf mines. They bear wolf-like features and sport armour and weapons, although they tend to be lazy and try to avoid a fight whenever possible. The Eastern Hemisphere represents a contrast to the Western half of the planet. The Plain of Perpetua makes up almost 50% of the Northern half of the continent. This trackless grassy lowland hides a bewildering maze of caverns beneath its presumed undisturbed surface. Within these rocky, encrusted and stalactited caves walk races of monsters sealed beneath the earth thousands of years before by great volcanic eruptions. Orcs, basilisks and giant centipedes travel the rocky bastion beneath the plain. Sorcery abounds here, only awaiting the knowing hands of a conjurer to cast a spell upon the innocent wayfarer to set them into a state of hibernation or suspended animation amongst the grasses and low bushes. South of the plain of Perpetua, the sands of time spreads its desert tentacles for hundreds of miles. Once in the dim history of Eternia, the desert bloomed like a vast garden. A civilization of craftsmen laboured here, building monuments to themselves. Only ruins remain for the occasional visitor to wonder about. However, they who traverse the waterless expanse must be careful, for great windstorms whip up unexpectedly among the monuments and whirlwinds. These create time vortices, sucking people back into the distant past, from which no one has ever returned. The mystic mountains make up the southern edge of the eastern continent. Reached in mystery, ogres, wraiths and manticores find haven beneath the granite peaks. The valleys of the mystic mountains, with their deep slippery sides, hold great reptiles and dragon prisoner. And it's fortunate, for they'd rampage the planet if not held within that stone fortress. 
The North and South Poles both have great snowy masses where life is hard, but not difficult for the families of snow dwarves and the great ice hacker, a bear-like creature with cunning intelligence. Oceans make up the balance of Eternia. The Harmony Sea lives up to its name as a peaceful expanse traversed by gentle trade winds. The royal ships of the king often sail from the safe harbour toward the eastern hemisphere in order to trade with the inhabitants on the other side of the globe. As in life, however, not all is consistent. The berserk islands poke their fiery mountain tops through the waters of the Harmony Sea. These last remnants of the great volcanoes which once dotted the whole planet belch fire and smoke. The ocean of Nile runs rough and white-capped throughout the year, bringing storms and chill to the land. For all its ferocity, Nile provides life, for the rain and snow it generates keeps the soil fertile and the crops growing. The Golden Isles rest like a peaceful, permanent eye of the storm within the ocean. They're a favourite vacation spot of Eternia's royal family. Royalty had not always reigned on the planet. Aeons before, an incredibly advanced civilization ruled Eternia. They had evolved through centuries of barbarism, enlightenment, scientific technology and philosophy, and drawn out all the secrets of the universe in order to work wondrous deeds. Was it magic, or sorcery, or wizardry, or the power of mind over matter which could change images, create objects where none existed, and marshal the total resources of nature? All the greatest Eternian minds walked toward one principal goal, that of peace and goodness. Their achievements provided Eternia with tranquility and harmony. The hub of Eternia, and the repository of all knowledge, rested within the great council of elders, who dwelt within the Hall of Wisdom, a magnificent edifice which shone with the light of a million stars. Made of Eternian stone and rare metals, it gleamed like a beacon of hope to all the world, a beckoning light of wisdom for all to see. The people of Eternia walked the glowing halls and saw the wondrous machines, computers of incredible sophistication, which held the combined intelligence of the Eternian centuries. Space portals permitted Eternians to travel through space in the blink of an eye, time corridors carrying them through time at will. All of this melded with the force of good. On Eternia, no one envied anyone else. Everyone lived in communion with each other. Even the animals lived in peace. However, the Council of Elders had cognizance of evil. They knew it existed somewhere in the void of space beyond their sight, and could be casting a jealous eye upon Eternia. Within moderation, Eternia's scientists developed sophisticated defense weapons, in the event the unthinkable should occur. These weapons they hid within the Hall of Wisdom, for the day they might be needed. While Eternia rolled peacefully through the heavens, a drama played itself out on another world within the same solar system. Unknown and unseen by Eternia, its orbit is precisely the same, and always lies directly opposite, perpetually shielded by Eternia's sun. Not only is the planet physically opposite Eternia, its people and their purpose are diametrically opposed as well. This planet, Infinita, holds the sum total of all the universe's evil, foreboding dark forces always at war. It has been held in check only by their own fiendishness. Their powers built war machines of incredible destructiveness. Infinita's charred surface bears mute testimony to the constant battle of the vile force with each other. The planet slowly sank back to a barbaric age, yet they maintained modern weapons of extermination. Lasers, quasars and photon guns wreaked devastation alongside spears, swords and axes. And where, on Eternia, sorcery and science accomplished all the good things in life, Infinita's black magic and alchemy destroyed and ruined life. One day, two of the greatest opposing forces faced each other across the dunes of doom, made black and unwholesome by the constant battles waged by the dark powers. Both sides believed they could win the war, the final Armageddon, for they were the only ones left on Infinita. Both sides held in their hands the ultimate weapon of desolation to be thrust at the enemy, before the foe retaliated. Both sides guessed wrong. The triggers snapped at exactly the same moment, and seconds later a cataclysmic explosion tore through the planet, leaving in its wake poisonous gas, flaming mountains, and a race of people whose mutated genes determined their future. 
the explosion created one other phenomenon, a space portal leading directly to Eternia. Hurtled through the portal, several of the most horrendous leaders of Infinita then found themselves in the midst of a lush, fertile, peaceful land. They swore it would be conquered. Slyly and slowly they infiltrated Eternia's society until the day came when they attempted to mount an invasion. Their troops rode through the space portal and all the weapons within the Hall of Wisdom came to the fore. Eternia drove back the Infinitans after many long battles and they sealed the space portal, but the Elders knew they couldn't keep evil from the planet any longer. Zodak the wise leader of the Council of Elders, called to the stars for advice. In a shimmering, gleaming beam, a figure appeared out of the cosmos, the figure of an elegant and beautiful woman, adorned in snake-shaped armour and bearing a twisted, snake-headed staff. She announced herself as the sorceress. Though dressed for battle, she loved peace as much as they. For centuries Eternia dwelt without fear, the sorceress told them, and now the time of testing fell upon the planet. For too long the Council had made all decisions. They had lost the ability to think for themselves. The time had arrived to cut the umbilical cord and permit Eternia the right to exist on its own. The Council listened to the vision which promised them that if ever the forces of evil should try overcoming Eternia, a champion would arise to defend the planet, a champion not seen in all the universe, a being so powerful and filled with good that evil, no matter how mighty, could not stand against him. However, with all the champion's virtue, he needed one more element to make him the ultimate ruler of the universe. He required the collective wisdom of the elders, and that he would not have until he proved himself against the dark forces. There lay the danger, for if the evil powers discovered the secret, this key to destiny, they might destroy all that's harmonious in Eternia. Once that occurred, light would go out all over the planet, and it could end with the same fate as Infinita. Zodak gathered the ex-Council of Elders in the Hall of Wisdom, and collectively they concentrated their mind force until the sheer power of their consciousness created a mighty force field. At that moment an implosion cracked through the corridors of the Hall, and the Council disappeared in a blinding flash of energy. Only Zodak retained his human form as one of Eternia's guardians. In the Council's place existed a mass of light, at once the densest material in the universe and as light as a ghost. It rose to the topmost parapet of the Hall of Wisdom, where the spirits of the Council looked to the far horizon, past the evergreen forest, beyond the vine jungle, above and through the ice mountains, to the sealed space portal. It knew that one day an infinitum would discover how to break the seal. That evil person would search for the magnificent Hall of Wisdom, the spirit, along with Zodak, determined that it would not be found, at least not in its present state. A great surge of energy burst forth from the mass of light which had been the Council of Elders. It surrounded the Hall of Wisdom, and an astonishing shuddering and shimmering arose as the very air around the hall glowed with a cosmic light. Anyone witnessing the experience would have seen an incredible sight, almost mirage-like. The hall's very atomic structure shifted, the molecules seemed to run wild as the building began to change form. The wisdom of that which was once the Council understood the demons of Infinita would look for the magnificent edifice embodying all that is wise and good. But if they saw a dark and forbidding place, they might go aside. The wisdom of the Council planned to hide the once beautiful hall behind the rocks, trees and overgrowth of the evergreen forest. When the atoms and molecules slowed, the Hall of Wisdom ceased to exist. In its place stood the dark, green, crenellated fortress of Castle Greyskull. Its craggy towers and black windows looked out upon Eternia. The most striking feature of the castle was the entrance. The portal had the face of a skull, the skull's lower jaw created a jawbridge, and anyone wishing to enter had to have immense courage. Behind these walls and within the corridors of Greyskull dwelt the wisdom transformed into the spirit of Greyskull. The sorceress remained, guarding the castle against all intruders. Zodak would sail the universe, keeping watch over Eternia, keeping vigilance over those who believed in virtue and wisdom, but not interfering with the natural course of events. 
Thus did Castle Greyskull slowly subside out of sight and the minds of all Eternians, save as myth and legend. Some of the devices created by the old science and magic remained, and these were used for transportation and hunting. Only one family had the secret of invention handed down from generation to generation. They were warned to use the knowledge judiciously until it was needed in defence of Eternia. Each generation had its own man-at-arms, skilled in the practical and mystical arts of the forge and machine, able to create devices of war as well as those of peace. They also knew the art of creating machines, able to distinguish between strangers and their rightful owner. So the centuries passed, and Eternia slipped quickly backward, to the point where men and women had to work with their backs, pitted against nature. Every now and then some remnant of sorcery would appear in the guise of a child who still had the power of mind over matter. Fear fast put a stop to the child's actions, and without exercise, the power disappeared. Eternia's society, once egalitarian and ruled by a wise council, yearned for a leader, someone to guide them through the troubled times, back to the halcyon days remembered only in songs and stories sung and told by bards and minstrels. Thus a king, selected by the people from amongst the wisest on the planet, was chosen to rule. His family reigned for hundreds of years, providing leadership, wisdom, gallantry and chivalry. In another universe, an event took place which had become almost prosaic. A space shuttle was about to be launched from the third planet of a minor solar system on the edge of an insignificant galaxy called the Milky Way. The shuttle pilot, Marlena Glenn, young, attractive and a brilliant scientist, donned her spacesuit, climbed into the pilot seat and waited for her three crewmates to belt in. The three others loitered in the ready room until the very last minute. Evelyn Powers, brilliant chemist, physicist and biologist, was insanely jealous of Marlena. Evelyn knew she would have been named pilot for the mission and carried within her heart an almost fanatical hatred for the person sitting at the shuttle's controls. Chief Technician Biff Beastman resented the whole shuttle program because it relegated him to the status of gopher. Had he known his role in the project, he would have returned to his small farm where at least he could rule despotically over the animals. Noted scientist Dr. T. E. Scope, inventor of numerous optic devices, rounded out the crew. After many attempts to get aboard a shuttle, his application finally had been accepted. He knew they despised him for his brain, and he swore that one day he would get even with all those little people who tried to deny him fame and fortune. The voice of space control rang out, calling for them to board the ship. Many changes had taken place since the early shuttle flights leaped into space, piggybacked to three enormous solid fuel rockets. Now the shuttle taxied down a runway using ordinary jet engines. Once it reached the edge of the stratosphere, its own boosters cut in, flinging the craft into cislunar space, where its ion drive engines took over for the almost speed of light trip to the other planets. As the shuttle rumbled down the runway, the crew and support team could not have known or foreseen coming events. The cataclysmic explosion on Infinita had been travelling through the void of space for a thousand years, and now it approached the edge of another universe just as the space shuttle's ion engines hummed to life. The craft aimed its nose at Europa, one of Jupiter's moons. The flight was uncomplicated and ordinary, save for the tension between the crew. With the ion engines forcing the shuttle to move to the limit of endurable speed, Europa came within view in only a few days. Marlena placed the craft in orbit around the moon, and the crew plotted a landing pattern. Suddenly, the shockwave from Infinita tore away at the very fabric of their universe. The spacecraft spun out of its orbit, and the crew slammed against the bulkheads, like so many ping-pong balls inside a bottle. The ship cartwheeled towards a rip in space and fell through the interspace void, only to reappear in the sky above Eternia. Marlena staggered to her feet and lurched to the captain's chair. She called out to the others. No one answered. When she looked, only the spacesuits remained, mute empty and wrinkled. Little time remained to brood as the shuttle shot into the Eternian atmosphere, glowing red, yellow and white. She nosed the craft up and bounced off the layer of air, slowing the vehicle for a smoother re-entry. Maleno couldn't spot any runways for the shuttle, so she aimed the ship at the only clear spot she saw. A long meadow in a lush green valley. The spacecraft hit the ground, its landing gear crumpled on impact, 
and it sank to its belly, skidding, pitching and crashing to a wrenching stop. Unconscious, Marlena couldn't know the helping hands pulling her out of the wreckage and carrying her to the royal palace of the reigning king of Eternia, the young and handsome Randor. For several days she slept in the palace, and each day Randor sat by her bedside and waited for her to wake. All the royal physicians and wizards provided potions and spells in order to ensure her well-being, and soon colour stirred in Marlena's cheeks. On the seventh day her eyes fluttered open, and the first sight she saw was Randor's rugged, handsome face. A spark flew between them as he reached out his fingers to touch her hand, and they both smiled. Meanwhile, the other members of the crew found themselves on the charred, misshapen surface of Infinita. The evil power of the planet seeped into their bones, causing their true personalities to emerge even as they lay there. Within minutes, their physical forms began to change, more in keeping with the rulers and slaves of Infinita. Evelyn Power's jealousy helped transform her knowledge of physics, chemistry and biology into sorcery for every evil purpose. Biff Beastman's cruel nature spilled on the outside and he became a true beast man with a lion's mane, fangs and the power to communicate with and to command bloodthirsty creatures such as dragons, gorgons, ogres and snakes. Dr. T. E. Scope's transformation changed that small, mean man into a brute with three eyes called Triclops, a man with three eyes who could see not only during the day but in the dark and around corners with his gamma vision. A new vitality soared through their veins as they woke with their new bodies to the horrid laughter of Infinity's remaining ruler, the evil, megalomaniacal, power-mad monster, Skeletor. Beneath his hood, eyes peered at them from the dark sockets of his skull face, and his voice rang hollowly from the recesses of his bony jaws. In his hand, he grasped the black, ram-headed havoc staff, he knew they were the minions he needed to break the space portal seal so he could invade and conquer Eternia. On the other hand, evil Lin, Beastman and Triclops recognised Skeletor as their device for wreaking vengeance through the universe. Skeletor led them to his lair beneath the twin peaks of Snake Mountain. Around one of the crags twisted a terrible carved snake. A path ran along the snake's back until it reached the fanged mouth. Entrance here entrapped the incautious stranger, for once a person stepped into the snake's jaws, they snapped shut, thrusting the trespasser into an almost inescapable dungeon. A footbridge connected one mountain with the other, where a blood-red waterfall cascaded over crags, past blasted trees and murky swamps. Skeletor's chamber hid behind blood falls, and only he knew its entrance, its traps and snares. The lair itself was a dark cavern dripping with venom. In one corner, its eyes blazing red, its tail twitching, sat Skeletor's pet and charger, the giant cat Panthor. Its purple fur glistened, its muscles rippled as it stretched out iron claws from its mighty paws. Skeletor waved his staff, and a charge of energy sprang forth, rolling back a huge boulder from one wall, uncovering a screen. A wave of his hand and a picture swam into view, a picture of Eternia, then that of King Randall and Marlena. At the sight of the former captain, the trio snarled and clenched their fists, and it wasn't lost on Skeletor. I see you feel as I do. You'd like to invade Eternia and conquer it. My reasons are simple enough. Infinita can no longer sustain life. We need Eternia's air and food, and I intend to take it by force. If you are with me, we can accomplish our aim. But before we do, we must break through the space portal, sealed centuries ago against my ancestors. Once that's done, we'll wipe out that simpering Eternian goodness, and our dark powers will reign over Eternia, over all the universe. King Randor made Mylena his queen, and three years later she bore an heir to the throne of Eternia, a son, Prince Adam. He was handsome and imbued with his mother's spirit of adventure and his father's courage. As a child, he had the run of the palace, playing tricks and practical jokes on his teachers and the nobles of the court. At the moment Prince Adam was born, man-at-arms, the heir to the secrets of weaponry and invention, strode through the evergreen forest, searching for rare herbs which he used as the base for a special sword-tempering oil, when he heard a rushing and flapping sound over his head. A giant shadow crossed the mighty warrior and protector of the palace, he looked up and saw an immense falcon circling above. 
Man-at-Arms crouched behind a tree and waited until the colossal bird settled on a nearby crag. The falcon opened its curved beak and seemed to call out. Then the warrior heard another voice, as if speaking within his mind. Man-at-Arms, it cried softly, come to Zor the falcon. The soldier hefted his battle axe in one hand and unlocked the holster which held his laser gun as he slowly walked towards the mighty falcon. There's no need for weapons. Look into Zor's eyes, whispered the voice. Zor blinked and stared at Man-at-Arms. There, within the black pupils of the bird's eyes, he saw the sorceress's image, the keeper of Castle Greyskull, as she spoke to him. He had been chosen for a very special mission, because his family had kept faith with Eternia. When Zor left the crag, he would discover a nest amongst the rocks, and inside that nest would be a child, a girl, who was the sorceress's daughter. Man-at-Arms was to take the baby and raise her as his very own. Train her alongside Prince Adam, brave warrior, as if she was your son. Train them both in the martial arts, in the use of weapons, both old and new. Don't spare her, because she's a girl. One day she'll need all the skills you give her. One more request I make of you. Never reveal the identity of her mother. That is something she must find for herself. Awestruck, man-at-arms stood flat-footed and flabbergasted. Sorceress, what will I call her? What's the child's name? Teela, said the sorceress. Teela, she said again, as Zor spread its expansive wings and flew off. Overwhelmed man-at-arms who had seen and heard many unusual and magical things in his life stood silent, staring at the disappearing shape of the titanic falcon. A cry rose from the rocks, and the soldier clambered up to find the baby girl, just as he'd been told. Prince Adam and Teela grew up together under the tutelage of man-at-arms. His laboratory was their playground. They romped and fought amongst the bewildering and astounding inventions whose secrets had been handed down over the generations. Man-at-arms created weapons and vehicles of wondrous sophistication. Some of his vehicles rolled along the ground at high speed, but weren't ready for use until he proved they worked properly. Prince Adam often got into trouble by trying out weapons and ground sleds before he knew how to use them. Many a bruise was dealt him in crashes and crack-ups. Teela took him as something of a scatterbrain. Where Teela studied seriously and fervently, learned the skills of battle, Adam played, joked and poked fun at his teachers. That's not to say he wasn't a good student. On the contrary, for all his playfulness, he received excellent grades, learned to wield a sword, bow and arrow and photon gun. The better he became, the more Teela became angry, because she thought this was a sombre business. One day Adam would be king, and he certainly wasn't acting very royally. King Randor and Queen Marlena cast uneasy eyes over Adam's pranks as well. Time would come, they thought, when he'd put away childish ideas and realise his destiny. But it appeared it might take a very long while. Even Adam's pet, the giant Eternian tiger, Cringer, seemed ill-suited to a prince of the realm. For all his ferocious looks, the tiger was a cowardly cat, hiding from danger when convenient, and satisfied to lie by the fire like an old yellow and black rug. During these formative years, eyes on Infinita kept watch over the actions on Eternia. Skeletor and his companions lusted and raged at what they saw. Fortunately, the sorceress hid from prying eyes those things which should be secret, such as Teela's true parentage. Skeletor, with the help of Evil Lynn, Beastman, Triclops, and other heinous characters, such as Merman, who made his home in the slime swamp of Infinita, plotted and planned how to break the seal of the space portal. Then it happened. The combined power of Skeletor's evil, Evil Lynn's sorcery, and Triclops' gamma vision began to melt the seal. Slowly the space portal opened, and Skeletor knew his day had arrived. That day coincided with Adam's and Teela's 18th birthdays, for they celebrated at the same time. A great feast took place within the palace. Teela sat with her father, Man-at-Arms, while King Randor and Queen Marlena looked anxiously at the chamber door, waiting for Adam's appearance. Musicians, magicians and acrobats entertained the gathered throng, with the finale being a mime presented by the great Eternian actor, Manny Faces, Master of Disguise, who could look, act, and talk like anyone he chose. Finally, Randor spoke to Man-at-Arms in order to find out if he knew why the prince was late. The warrior inventor shrugged his armor-clad shoulders, 
but Teela spoke up in a sarcastic voice. He's probably out in the field somewhere, playing with that chicken-hearted tiger and trying to impress some girls, she said derisively. Queen Marlena requested that Teela remind Adam of the celebration and his duty to his people. Teela objected, but man at arms stern glance convinced her to do as she was told. Skeletor and his band of renegades stood before the portal, which now opened wide. He relished this moment just before stepping through and onto the surface of Eternia. The others stood behind their master, only waiting for the word. Evil Lynn rubbed her hands with glee, while Beastman snapped his stun whip in the air. Triclops tried looking through the space portal, but even his vision wasn't sharp enough to cut through the murky cloud. Merman, still dripping with primordial ooze, salivated at the thought of new worlds to conquer. Beastman turned to Skeletor, and a light blazed in his eyes as he reminded the skeleton-faced brute that beneath Eternia's surface dwelt monsters upon which he could call to do his bidding. The monsters had been kept in confinement for thousands of years by the combined mind power of the planet's ancients. Once they entered the portal, all the forces of evil would unleash themselves, and the dragons, griffins, gorgons, orcs, and other foul beasts would be under Beastman's subjugation. Skeletor reminded the lion-maned recreant that while those base creatures might be under Beastman's influence, Beastman remained under Skeletor's power. Teela almost forcibly dragged Adam back to the festival chamber, and all the court rose and cheered the young prince, who one day would rule Eternia. He sat between his parents and proposed a toast. Friends, all who know me for these eighteen years, I raise a cup to those who taught me everything, and to whom I owe my strength of arms. Hail, man-at-arms! When everyone had drained the first cup, Adam stood once more, and a toast to one other with whom I fought, laughed, and played, someone who tried and still tries to keep me on the straight and narrow path. Unfortunately, it doesn't work too often. To my best friend, Teela. The young woman didn't know whether to acknowledge the toast or throw her cup at the prince. Restrained by her father, she settled back. King Randor announced that in celebration of Teela's birthday and in honour of her strength and prowess with weapons, she would be named Captain of the Royal Guard. Teela bowed to the king, then leaped to the centre of the room. Targets had been mounted on the walls, and, as swift as a bird, with the strength of a she-lion, she literally shattered each bullseye with axe, laser, halberd, and photon gun. Then she whipped out a quasar, and quickly carved the royal signet in the granite wall of the chamber. Next, three of the strongest men in Eternia entered the room and challenged her at one time. Teela darted back and forth, lashing out with fists and feet and lightning thrusts, until all three adversaries found themselves on their backs from the onslaught. All of a sudden the palace shook, as if an earthquake rolled across the land. Everyone paused and waited for the aftershock, but none came. The king bade the people to continue feasting. Only man-at-arms seemed ill at ease, and Adam saw it in his eyes. He tried to speak to his teacher, but the warrior sat as if in a trance. A voice spoke to man-at-arms, a voice he hadn't heard in eighteen years, the voice of the sorceress. Man-at-arms, she whispered in his inner ear. You, who have been the guardian of Eternia's war secrets, an evil power greater than any witnessed in all the universe, threatens our world. You must come to Castle Greyskull with Prince Adam. There can be no delay. Man at Arms turned to Adam and grabbed him by the arm. They had to leave immediately, and no one must know where they were. The look on his teacher's face told Adam more than mere words. He nodded his head and suggested that Man at Arms leave first. The prince would join him at the edge of the castle grounds. During Manny Face's mime, Adam slipped out the side door and ran to Man at Arm's side. He wanted to know what was going on and where they were going. Man at Arm's told him. They headed for Castle Greyskull, and the prince laughed. Castle Greyskull? questioned Adam. It doesn't exist. It's part of Eternia's mythology. No one's ever seen it or been able to find it. An immense shadow passed overhead as Zor the Falcon skimmed the very treetops. Man at Arm's pointed skyward. There's our guide. Don't ask questions. Far to the north, on the ice mountains, an avalanche rolled down the slope. Where the snow and rock had been high on the crag, there now shimmered a hole. Not a cave or cavern, not part of the mountain, but hovering in space. Blinked and winked the once sealed space portal, which had kept the tyrants of Infinita from invading Eternia. Skeletor, Beastman, Evil Lynn, Triclops and Merman strode from the portal. 
They stepped out, and fierce winds roared about them. Skeletor stretched out his arms, clenched the havoc staff, and from its ram's head eyes rays poured. Skeletor laughed as the staff quivered in his hands. You can feel it in the very air, that sense of goodness and purity. Oh, I remember the stories of my ancestors passed down through the ages. Conquer that spirit of goodness, whatever it is, and I could rule the universe, for within it lies all the wisdom of Eternia. Come on, my friends, let's look at our future home. With that he called Panthor, and the great purple cat bounded to his side, the green saddle in place. Skeletor mounted the beast and charged off, leaving his companions behind. Man-at-Arms and Adam forged their way deeper and deeper into the evergreen forest. Always ahead of them, the falcon slowly glided, every now and then flapping its immense wings. It caught the updrafts, spiralled into the sky, then deftly drifted down in ever-widening circles. Adam thought Man-at-Arms had lost his wits. Following a bird into the uncharted depths of the forest seemed folly, until Man-at-Arms halted his relentless trek and pointed through the great trees. A prince peered through the interlaced branches. Something glimmered green and grey, something solid and substantial, but hidden behind the ferns and trees of the evergreen forest, something ancient, dark and mysterious loomed ahead. The falcon disappeared with a dive into the thicket as the two Eternians stood before an impenetrable wall of tree trunks, branches and thorn bushes. Adam asked Man-at-Arms how he intended to get through, and his teacher unholstered his laser gun. One blast would clear the way. Before he drew it out, however, the sorceress's voice told him to put away his weapon. The trees began to separate as intertwined branches let go of each other and the thorn bushes parted a path. Adam and Man-at-Arms stood rooted to the spot, for before them towered the eminence of Castle Greyskull. The castle glowered down at them. The immense jewel bridge appeared sealed tight after centuries of inactivity. The black tower stared at them as if daring them to step closer. Adam thought he must be dreaming, for Greyskull was only a story told to children at bedtime. Yet here was the ancient fortress, supposedly the guardian of all Eternia's secrets. Many times he'd heard the ballads and tales that he who possessed Castle Greyskull could have untold wealth and power. Now it was here, in front of him, and he was timid before its awesomeness. Adam's reverie snapped as thunder rolled from the castle and the jaw bridge descended. Within the entrance to Greyskull stood the figure of a woman, holding a golden serpentine staff which seemed alive. The sorceress beckoned Man-at-Arms and Adam to follow her inside the edifice, Slowly and carefully they entered, and the jaw bridge snapped closed, shutting out all light. The sorceress's staff provided a beacon as the strange trio moved through rock-carved corridors and up narrow staircases until they reached a great bolted door. The sorceress pointed her staff at the entry, the bolts flew back, and the door swung open, revealing a chamber which delighted Man-at-Arms' eyes. Therein, a myriad of scientific instruments filled the room, Lights blinked from numberless microprocessors created from the very stuff of the universe. An amorphous shape hovered in the centre of the sanctum. The sorceress addressed the two men. She knew they were curious and wanted to understand what was transpiring. Man-at-Arms had only been told that great danger existed. Adam still remained in the dark. She would show them the danger, she said, as she pointed her staff at the cloud, and a picture resolved itself. There, at the space portal within the ice mountains, stood Beast Man, Evil Lynn, Triclops and Merman. The picture quivered, and now Skeletor appeared, with his gruesome, fearful countenance. The sorceress proceeded to tell Man-at-Arms and Adam a brief history of Eternia, and how Greyskull came into existence. She withheld the story of the Council of Elders, for that would be told in its time. Adam asked who this champion would be, where did he come from? With that, the sorceress looked upon the prince with her stern, dark, wise eyes. She told him there was one who could save Eternia and the universe. Perhaps in time he would also rule as the true master of the universe, along with others of good heart and true. Man-at-Arms at last broke his silence. He also wished to know where this champion lived, and why hadn't he come forth at once. To this the sorceress answered, He is one among you, the last to be thought, and yet the first in many minds. She raised her serpent staff, and out of the very air within the chamber, a brilliant light 
gathered together into a magnificent sword which gleamed with the soul of a thousand fires. Behold the sword of power, created from the very heart of Castle Greyskull, and imbued with the forces of the ancients who once dwelt bodily within its walls at a very different time. Take hold of the sword, man-at-arms. The warrior teacher reached out and grabbed the handle. A knot of pain raced from the weapon through his hand and into his arm. As quickly as he snatched the sword, he let it go. Man-at-arms had never experienced such excruciating anguish in his life, and he had been through battles where swords and lasers and photons left scars as testimony to his bravery. Adam watched in amazement. Never before had he seen his teacher flinch at anything. The sword knows its master, intoned the sorceress. Adam, take the sword. The prince backed off, shaking his head. If it could make man-at-arms wary, he was no match for this dancing blade. The sorceress's voice poured forth like a tempest. Take the sword, Prince Adam. With a pounding heart, Adam reached out a steady hand, ready to retreat in a moment. He didn't have to grasp the hilt, for it floated gently into his palm. The grip felt as if it had been moulded to his hand. It was light as a feather, and seemed to shine brighter as he held it. Adam looked questioningly at the sorceress. Man-at-arms backed away from his young pupil, as the guardian of Greyskull approached the prince. "'Hear me and hear me well,' she said firmly. "'The mastery of the Sword of Power is insignificant to the mastery of yourself and the conquest of evil which even now stands upon Eternia. You, Prince Adam, are heir to all of Eternia's wisdom and power, but it shall not come easily. For you must earn it by your actions, and your actions will be dictated by your heart and your head. You shall go forth and battle the power-mad Skeletor, that spawn of a base and vile world where treachery rules. You shall use your might to defeat his renegade companions, who subject themselves to his will for the hope that they may rule Eternia by his side. Standing straight and tall, Adam demanded to know how he, a mere mortal, could accomplish all the things desired by the sorceress. Within you, chanted the Keeper of Greyskull, is a soul of power and might and truth, the soul of one called He-Man. Adam continued without comprehension, looking at this strange woman of miracles. Raise the sword above your head, Prince Adam. He lifted the blade towards the heavens. Now call out, by the power of Greyskull. Adam opened his mouth, but the words stuck in his throat. Man-at-arm stepped to Adam's side and prodded his student. Adam finally shouted the words. A blazing, brilliant, flaring burst of light illuminated the room. Man-at-arms shielded his eyes from the incredible white blast of energy. The prince was obliterated from sight, save for the sword of power, which seemed suspended over the spot where Adam stood. The light faded, and when Man-at-arms opened his eyes, in place of the prince stood a man vaguely resembling Prince Adam, with mighty rippling muscles, taller by a head than the prince, with shaggy shoulder-length hair, piercing eyes, clad in a battle kilt, shod with leather boots strapped about with supple metal bands and girded by a belt of many pockets. This was He-Man, champion of Eternia, bearer of all Eternia's virtue. He-Man looked down and about himself in amazement. Incredulously, he asked the sorceress what happened to him, in a voice which boomed with great authority. The sorceress told him that his destiny was to drive the evil powers from Eternia, to protect it and its people from Skeletor, who wished to rule the universe through the Dark Powers, and to prevent the Demon of Infinita from discovering and destroying the secret of Greyskull. The Sword of Power had the ability to cut through almost anything on Eternia, as well as to ward off magic and sorcery. She held out a shield, which almost vibrated with a life of its own. The shield could repel both magic spells and all weapons. With that, He-Man wanted to know what was the secret. The sorceress beckoned the mighty warrior to follow her. Man-at-arms walked behind He-Man, but she stopped him. The secret would be He-Man's alone, for Man-at-arms was a mere mortal and should not be subjected to the possibility of inadvertently revealing the mystic power of Greyskull. Slipping the Sword of Power into his belt, He-Man descended into the very bowels of the castle. The sorceress tapped her staff upon the dark, moss-covered stones of the lowest dungeon. The floor dissolved as if made of water, and a vapour flowed up and about them as they slowly sank through a star-filled chamber 
where the very walls glowed with an inner light. Then the stones above them became solid once more. The chamber in which He-Man and the sorceress stood seemed constructed entirely of crystals, which contained a light of purity and beauty. Within one of the crystal panels pulsed a blue-white orb, neither quartz nor organic. The sorceress bade He-Man listen carefully, and he heard voices emanating from the pulsing sphere. It wasn't one voice, but multiple sounds, of many people speaking at once. These are the voices of Eternia's ancient elders, whispered the sorceress. Concentrated within that globe, all the wisdom of the planet awaits he who shall destroy the purveyors of disaster and redeem the universe. But be warned, He-Man, that if Skeletor discovers the secret of Grayskull, he will crush it, for wisdom and virtue are fragile things indeed. Then all goodness will be wiped out, permitting corruption to reign over the galaxies, planets and the stars. This is your challenge. Use your strength wisely. As He-Man, you can run as swift as the arrow flies. You can move and lift thousands of pounds. You have the power of concentration which permits you to bend steel bars and crush iron with your bare hands. Your wisdom can overcome illusion cast by evil and dark powers. You have one great advantage, He-Man, over all Eternia's enemies, and that is a steadiness of purpose and the knowledge that you fight for right. Man at arms waited for the sorceress's return. He ruminated what he had seen or thought he saw. Perhaps it had been illusion. To think of Adam as the planet's saviour seemed ludicrous. But it was a perfect disguise. Who would ever think that the fun-loving prankster could be a majestic warrior? At that moment a hollow laugh rang out, and when he peered at the amorphous cloud, another picture emerged. Skeletor and his evil compatriots stood at the walls of the royal palace. With a wave of his ram-headed havoc staff, the iron-bound doors splintered and crashed to the ground. Panthor, with his master astride, padded into the king's own council room. Teela charged the demon, but her weapons were no match for Skeletor's sorcery, as the very energy disappeared from her quasar, and she was driven back to witness a blinding flash which locked Randor and Marlena into the space-time dimension, as if they were disembodied souls. Teela knew she had to find her father, and escaped with Cringer at her heels. In Castle Greyskull, Adam entered the chamber to see a white-faced man-at-arms. He told the prince what happened. They had to get back to the palace, in order to rescue his father and mother. As they bolted through the jawbridge, they saw the sorceress standing atop one of the parapets. It begins now, she called. As Man-at-Arms and Adam raced through the evergreen forest, the teacher asked the prince if he had dreamed all that occurred. With that question, Adam drew the sword from its scabbard, cried by the power of Greyskull. The blade flashed. The transformation took place without a break in stride. Man-at-Arms knew the vision had been no dream. The blaze from the sword shot upwards, glanced off the bright snow-capped peaks of the ice mountains, and caromed back to earth, where it struck Cringer, running at Teela's heels. The cat stumbled with a dazed look on his feline face, and underwent a phenomenal metamorphosis. The cowardly cat grew huge and muscular, his colour changed to green with yellow stripes, girded with saddle and helmet, and snarling for a fight. With great leaps Battle Cat loomed through the forest, heading for his master, He-Man. Man-at-Arms was the first to see the gigantic beast, and he drew his laser gun, only to have his hand stayed by He-Man. The champion told the warrior that this was Battle Cat, the sorceress's answer to Skeletor's panthor. He leaped upon the animal, pulling Man-at-Arms with him, and they careened towards the palace. Battle Cat's transfiguration not only gave him bravery and strength, but the power of speech, and he growled that Teela had escaped from the palace and headed their way. He-Man gave the steed his head. The armor-clad cat unerringly aimed for Teela, and when their paths crossed, the captain of the guard veered back with sword in hand. Man-at-arms jumped from the cat's back, surprising Teela with his sudden appearance on that apparition. Explanations could wait, he informed her. They had to rescue the king and queen and free the palace from Skeletor's dominion. He-Man reached down, and with an easy lift propelled Teela onto Battle Cat's back, along with her father. The woman grasped the champion about the waist, as the animal almost soared through the trees. Skeletor rampaged through the palace, chortling with fanatic glee. Randor and Marlena, locked in the space-time dimension, 
could only hear, and Skeletor knew it, taunting them with his demonic desire to conquer Eternia, learn its secrets, and rule the universe through havoc, rage, desolation, and destruction. In their own way, Evil Lynn, Beastman, and Triclops relished their dominion over Marlena. Without telling her who they had once been, they tortured the Queen with their knowledge of her past life and their eagerness to get her dissolute son Adam in their grasp. They'd teach him the ways of Infinita and watch the King and Queen squirm with anguish. He-Man, Manatarms, Teela and Battle Cat moved carefully towards the palace. No guards watched the destroyed entrance or stood upon the towers. The once bright and happy mansion reeked with a fetid odour, the smell of Infinita. Teela warned He-Man of Skeletor's magic, and the paladin smiled confidently. First, they had to get rid of Skeletor's companions, and since Evil Lim was also a sorceress, she might be difficult, so subterfuge was the order of the day. Battle Cat would make a frontal assault, leading Beastman away from the palace, while Teela enticed the three-eyed terror from his post. Man-at-Arms would force Evil Lin into a wild goose chase, permitting He-Man's confrontation with Skeletor. He trusted his buckler, shield and sword would work. At least, it would provide a good testing ground. Battle Cat roared into the palace, and just as He-Man predicted, Beastman charged after the cat, snapping and cracking his stun whip, thinking that he could control the giant tiger. Teela encountered Triclops, but not before his gamma vision picked her out as he came around the corner. His power mace whistled through the air, but Teela leaped out of the way, wrested a staff from the wall, and Triclops found himself in a battle with one of the strongest, most agile and cunning warriors on Eternia. Man at arms needed all the skill at his command when he encountered Evil Lin and Merman. Her fierce sorcery could render a man into a charred ash. Unfortunately, her wild, intemperate nature prevented Evil Lin from living up to her potential. Man at arms' armor protected him from the onslaught of energy darts, lightning bolts, and fireballs, and Evil Lin wasn't helped by a cowardly Merman who ran at the first opportunity. Using his own lasers and photon guns, he countered her wizardry with science as they careened through the palace. Randor and Marlena's cries echoed through the great estate, and He-Man shuddered at the thought of their capture by Skeletor. Bursting through one door after another, he hunted the bony-faced terror. A clap of thunder broke before the champion, and there stood Skeletor, his havoc staff held before him. The vicious devil had never seen such a person before, one who dared challenge his destructive powers. He-Man strode forward and demanded Skeletor release his prisoners. His answer was a flash of fire enveloping He-Man. The fighter concentrated his energy and the fiery illusion disappeared. He charged headlong toward the demon. Bolts of force flared forth from Skeletor only to be warded off by He-Man's weapons. Then Skeletor summoned up a phalanx of ghastly creatures from the depths of hell. Harpies and hags, gargoyles and goblins, spectres and quasits with fangs, barbs and claws formed a shield between the hero and villain. Although his shield and sword prevented him from mortal wounds, he felt their hot, repulsive breath upon his face, the claws and fangs tearing at him, the utter miasma of their malodorous bodies surrounding him while he tore through the creatures. Skeletor raised his Havoc Staff, but not before He-Man retrieved a razor-sharp whizzer from his belt and propelled it at the staff, slashing it from Skeletor's hand. The magic shield before him, he dived forward, slamming the skeleton-faced brute against a wall and warning him to release Randor and Marlena or all the power of Greyskull would destroy him. Skeletor had never faced such a foe as He-Man before and released control of the King and Queen. They reappeared and He-Man ran to their side, allowing Skeletor to escape through the space portal to Infinita and the relative safety of the Snake Mountain. The palace rejoiced and accolades were rained upon He-Man, champion and defender of Eternia. However, he didn't wait for the honours. This new knight errant swiftly flew from the palace, and in his place came Prince Adam, the boy who loved to play and never seemed to grow up. Our story doesn't end here, it only begins. Adam, He-Man, must always stay vigilant against the forces of evil forged by the demonic hand of Skeletor. The ruler of Infinita realises that within Castle Greyskull resides not only He-Man's power, but the secret to ruling the universe. He doesn't know its true nature, and He-Man must prevent Skeletor from finding out. He-Man has the help of tried and true friends in Man at Arms, Teela and Battle Cat. Along the way, others join forces with He-Man, fighters for justice, such as... Gorpo, 
a tiny mystical alien who dropped in quite unexpectedly from another dimension and makes himself at home in the royal palace. Gorpo doesn't usually walk, instead he floats a couple of feet off the ground. His amusing tricks and quick wit entertain the king and queen, who decreed the alien to be the official magical jester in residence. Unfortunately, Gorpo's magic doesn't always work as well as it should. Gorpo has a hard enough time just pulling a rabbit from a helmet or making an egg materialise. The rabbit inevitably gets loose and sends Cringer up a tree, and the egg may materialise in Man-at-Arms' pocket, broken. Because he's always popping up at odd places, Gorpo discovers Adam's other persona and is sworn to secrecy by the sorceress. Stratos, feathered hero of the skyways and leader of Avion, situated high amongst the peaks of the Mystic Mountains, where his people and family dwell. Stratos' wife, Delora, is a human from the Fertile Lands, near the Royal Palace. Stratos became He-Man's lifelong friend when the Champion of Eternia saved Avion from Skeletor's vengeance. His aerial acrobatics create discord among Skeletor's mere minions, and he uses his agility in the air to help He-Man in his constant fight against evil. Ram Man, the bullet-headed, armor-plated fighter's greatest asset, is his ability to ram down any object that gets in his or He-Man's way. Ram Man's a bit of a klutz who often stumbles over solutions without any awareness that he's done so, thus helping He-Man uncover plots and solve some of Eternia's more enigmatic mysteries. Many Faces Eternia's most distinguished actor, a master of disguise, who can, in an instant, transform himself into anyone or anything. He'd like nothing better than to perform upon the stage, but since Skeletor's coming, he places himself at He-Man's command whenever his unique skills are required. Manny Faces has one disguise which he uses infrequently. He becomes a raging beast, but only against the enemies of Eternia. Lizard Man moves quickly, quietly, and has the agility of his namesake. He climbs perpendicular walls, and his tough lizard skin provides protection against most of his enemies. Liz has one drawback. Every year he molts and becomes vulnerable to attack, and completely useless to anyone. Spy Man, an able fighter, he has the ability to literally periscope his neck above obstacles in order to survey his landscape. This trait comes in handy when he's with He-Man, and they have to know where the enemy is located. Bug Off, part man, part beetle, but with high-tech wings, flies swiftly and fast. His sword and lance are his stingers. Bug Off's beetle-like armor protects him from many dangers, including some of the laser weapons of Skeletor and his crew. Man-at-Arms' inventions prove invaluable to the conquest of evil, as He-Man's needs call for all the ingenuity the inventor can muster. Some of Man-at-Arms' creations are Wind Raider, a powerful jet-propelled craft capable of flying through the Eternian skies and whipping through the Harmony Sea or the Ocean of Null. Equipped with laser and photon guns, the vehicle seats two people, but it takes He-Man's skill to master the controls, although Teela has learned how to handle the vehicle under the champion's instruction. Battle Ram, an enormous four-wheeled vehicle capable of battering down anything in its way, including mountains, iron doors, or even people. Controls for the Ram are within a Quasar-equipped sky sled, which, when detached, becomes a fast-flying transport for one person. Attack Track, a mechanized vehicle which carries up to four people, and sort of has a mind of its own, loping along on four elliptical wheels as it climbs hills, fords, streams, and generally can go where other wheeled vehicles dare not tread. It obeys only He-Man's commands. If one of the villains attempts to ride the attack track, it bucks and rears like a bronco, with a burr under its saddle. Anyone trying to steal the machine finds feet a much more reliable mode of transportation. Talon Fighter This winged flying vehicle carries two passengers, and is able to execute death-defying aerial acrobatics. Equipped with a special bomb pack under its belly, He-Man can call the fighter when it's needed. Its resting place is atop a far peak, called Mount Dread, which materialises whenever the Talon fighter comes to rest. Only He-Man has the physical fortitude and strength of will to control it. The flying machine goes out of control unless He-Man's in command. Tri-Track, a three-wheeled motorcycle which He-Man uses whenever he needs a fast ground transport. Tri-Track travels most of the places the attack track goes, only much faster. The motorcycle bears two very deadly photon machine guns. Roton. When this vehicle's in the fight, He-Man's enemies scatter, literally. 
He-Man rides atop the round vehicle, which has a swiftly moving buzzsaw whipping around its centre. Instead of blades, the buzzsaw's blunted, club-like appendages sweep away anything or anyone in the way. What of Skeletor's company? He'll call up a wicked arsenal of wizardry, sorcery, beasts and creatures in his quest to destroy all that is good on Eternia. Some of his renegades of revenge are... Trapjaw, part human, part robot. He's a fearsome criminal stranded on Infinita and fallen under the command of Skeletor. Trapjaw has a removable artificial arm which can be replaced by a laser blaster, sword or other devices of evil. Sometimes he isn't fast enough to make the change, then He-Man or his friends get the better of the vicious criminal. His jaw is a hideous steel trap which can chew through almost anything and he's totally evil and villainous. Faker looks exactly like He-Man, but he's an android created by Skeletor's evil science. Skeletor uses Faker in order to gain the confidence of He-Man's friends, thus making it easier for the skull-faced demon to wreak his havoc on Eternia. Faker can be outwitted by having his microprocessors fouled up. His machinery is hidden beneath a removable breastplate, and the android must be serviced regularly, or he acts up. Black Widow, as his name suggests, this creepy individual has no scruples whatsoever. His chief asset is the ability to spin a strong web line in order to climb, snare and imprison those against he seeks revenge. Fang Man, a reptilian monster who, when he wants to disable his foe, breathes a sleeping gas upon them so they can be taken captive. Chopper has a right hand that's enormous. With one mighty blow this villain can chop through bricks, trees, anything that gets in his way. He's formidable in hand-to-hand -hand combat. Skeletor's own inventiveness, while not the equal to man-at-arms, comes up with some special vehicles of his own, such as Tornado Traveller, a wild, wind-whipping flying craft which only Skeletor can control through the skies of both Infinita and Eternia. Whenever it appears, it's preceded by a violent windstorm. War Sled. This roving-wheeled vehicle is the evil opposite of the battle ram and does many of the same things. Grinder, a four-wheeled vehicle capable of crushing anything in its path to a pulp. Beastman loves this machine because of its cruel, insensitive nature. These, then, are the forces of good and evil at work in that far solar system where demons, demigods, heroes and champions battle, where He-Man fights a never-ending war to wipe out evil from Eternia and to ensure that goodness, purity and virtue reign supreme throughout the universe.